Buenas tardes, mi amigos. All right. A lot of people wonder why I have been involved now with energy systems and trying to bring out the new energy systems for a new civilization on this planet. And many people don't see the connection between extraterrestrial intelligence, the Disclosure Project, and the Orionproject.org. And I want to just take a moment to make those connections. Because I think it's very, very important that people understand that these are three projects that I direct that are really all part of one strategy. Now, many of you know that the whole UFO question has been kept secret for more than 60 years. And there are a number of reasons why. Number one, in the early days, they didn't know what they were dealing with. Number two, there were reasons that were a theological and religious. And some of those still continue for some people in the secret uh, government. For example, there's a Jet Propulsion Lab scientist that I know, very senior, who told me very directly that there are structures, ancient structures, on Mars connected to a civilization that's connected to early human civilization on Earth. And he has confirmed this to me and he said, but the reason that NASA will not disclose this sort of information is that it would collapse, and I'm quoting, collapse the foundations of all the orthodox religious belief systems on the planet. To which I said, bueno. <laughs> but this is a problem in some sectors of the society. And so, for example, in America, 25% of the population believe literally the world is only 6,000 years old. One in four Americans. They think we rode dinosaurs with saddles. And there is a museum in Kentucky dedicated, a $26 million museum, dedicated to showing how children were riding the, the dinosaurs 6,000 years ago. So there are people who don't want to hear the truth about many things. So that has been one of the reasons. And I know it sounds insane to any educated person and probably to most people in, in Europe and Spain. But in America, one in four people believe that. They're like children. Yeah. Nespa. Yeah. Idiots. <laughs> you know, like Sarah Palin and people like that. So, <laughs> however, there is another reason. If they have been able to keep these UFO matters secret, they can provide a certain amount of information to the public and control it and spin it in a way that will be frightening. And by indoctrinating over a few decades the populace with fear, they hope to create a new enemy to unite the world around a military junta. So fear is the mind killer, and fear is the spirit killer. And this is they're hoping that this sort of midbrain of humans, where we have this fight or flight response, the primitive, very uh, muy primitivo, uh, that this will cause people to uh, give up their mind and their heart and their higher spiritual state and succumb to sort of a uh, brave new world of conflict with these beings. And this is what Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, his uh, spokeswoman for the last five years of his life said in this Disclosure Project testimony that this was a long-term plan to hoax a threat from outer space. So that has been another large agenda. And by keeping it secret enough, but putting information out in small amounts that they can control, they are trying to do a long-term psychological warfare operation. I have a 1953 CIA document that explicitly talks about the psychological warfare value of this subject in this regard. So there's another reason. Now, the big reason in 2009, from 19, I would say, 60s until now, the big reason is because if we announce to the world that there are these things that I was showing earlier, flying around, that can be hovering 
and then go 20,000 kilometers an hour instantly and make right-hand turns and disappear and reappear 40 miles away. Any scientist with an IQ greater than mud, dirt, is going to say, how are these things doing this? And when that question is asked, it shall be answered. And when it is answered, it means that the energy, propulsion, transportation, all of these technologies will be known. You cannot have a disclosure on the subject that we're being visited and that they've gone through interstellar space at multiples of the speed of light without opening up this other question of how. And since it's been studied, and it can be proven to be studied, in reverse engineering programs for at least 60 years, probably longer, that information will come out almost immediately. And when that comes out, guess what? It's a wonderful day for humanity, the 99.999% of us that do not own an oil field or an energy company or a power station. However, remember this little number. There are about, depending on the price of commodities, 400 trillion euros in derivatives, assets and commodities that are traded based on proven oil reserves, coal reserves, natural gas reserves. 400 trillion euros. This is a lot of chump change. This is a lot of walking around money for somebody, yeah. And that kind of money buys you a lot of corruption and a lot of influence. And there's one more thing, more important. The money isn't important. Because the money at that scale, you know, money to me and to you is that, gee, I have a daughter at Yale, I have a daughter at Stanford, you know, can I put them through college, can I, you know, feed my family while I'm doing this crazy stuff? <coughs> Not been easy. But here's the question. For these people who have unlimited sources of funding, these are the people who print the money, the printing presses. No, really, the central bankers, the financial people, the petrodollar, the big energy, oil cartels. For them, it's more about maintaining their relative power in the world. But what happens when you, and you, and you, and you have a generator that would fit on maybe this much of your of a table, sorry, that would completely run your house with no energy bill, no pollution. Once you buy it, it costs no more than a heat pump or air conditioning unit. And you have energy for your, your property for as long as the machine lasts, which if it's built well could be 100 years, 50 years. Wonderful, yes? Well, not for these people. It's wonderful for humanity, for Gaia, the Earth. But here's another issue, and this will make you a little uncomfortable. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. But there's a big element of racism in this paradigm. Because right now, those of us in Europe and America, which together may be 600 million people, in a planet with 7 billion, consume most of the planet's resources, and we have these wonderful air-conditioned halls and cars using petrol. But guess what? Now India and China, with two and a half billion people, want to live like this. And so does Africa. And so does all of Asia and the islands. And why shouldn't they? And the impoverished areas of Central and South America. Why not? Ah, here's the conundrum we are in. If all those people live like you and I do, using the current energy paradigm, long before we collapse the biosphere, we will be going to Mad Max under the Thunderdome, fighting and killing each other for the last barrel of oil. And so the economic system is set up to ensure 
80% of the world is in poverty. And this is a crime not only against the earth we are killing, but humanity. So it is an act of compassion to say we must bring out these sciences and technologies along with the disclosure that we're not along and along with what CSETI is doing, CSETI.org, which is making diplomatic contact with these visitors to establish a foundation for universal peace, not just world peace. So these three projects are all going together. Now I'm gonna focus right now for a little while on this energy question. What happens when every village in India and Africa can have such a device as I describe? I've seen them. I've seen them operate. There's no question they do exist. We would like to bring one out. If we could do so, we're trying. Anybody who has one, let me know. Who's got the cojones, excuse me, to do it. We'll go the distance if you will. Sorry. I'm very blunt, I'm emergency doctor, uh, Americanos. Now, here's another point, is that if all these villages in Africa and India have this energy system, guess what? Where does geopolitical power come from? Not the number of people in your country. If that were true, China and India would be the most powerful countries in the world, not America and Europe. Geopolitical power comes from your economic and technological prowess. When we democratize these technologies and allow them to be available throughout the world, we will have to put a seat at the geopolitical table for the people of Africa, the people of India, the people of China, the people of Indo Southeast Asia, the people of Central America, the people all around the world. And there are people who don't want to share that power. They like having it for themselves. If this is really what the question is. It's a very fundamental issue. Because if you allow these technologies to be known, within one generation, 20 years, the environment will be transformed. We will have a new macroeconomic system. The work week for the average person will fall to about 15 to 20 hours a week. Seriously. Manufacturing would become very inexpensive. And the world, this would be the tide that would lift all ships. But the centralized power system we have, based on super tankers bringing oil and central power plants burning coal or nuclear power or what have you, that system is centralized, but so is the metaphorical or the uh, symbolic power of the geopolitical system. And all of that would change, tilt. It is the biggest change in the history of the human race. And if you added up everything from the mid-1800s with the dawn of the uh, Industrial Revolution to today, Microsoft, computers, lasers, the internal combustion engines, rockets, jets, this d disclosure and the bringing forward of these new energy technologies will eclipse all of them added together. It is breathtaking. And when I have sat with people in, who are very powerful, they say, oh yes. I'll tell you what an admiral said, who is in charge of CONUS, uh, Continental United States, C-O-N-U-S. And he said, yes, you're absolutely right. This should come out. It should have never been kept secret. However, my job really has been maintaining the status quo of the world's oil supply and energy supply. It really is. And I don't want to deal with a change this big. I just want to retire and go fishing at my ranch in Wyoming. Now these people put their pants on one leg at a time. And many of them don't want to take on such a huge issue. And when they have suggested it, then they're threatened. Let me tell you what happened to our former CIA director who really believed we were long past due for the truth. The truth. This is the subtitle of the conference here. Wonderful individual late in life. He kind of came around 
You know, I believe all people. No matter, I know, you cannot demonize people on this planet or anywhere else. Everyone is educable. Maybe an, I'm an optimist. But I believe it, that basically all of us have a, the spark of goodness within us and we can do the right thing. And so through a lot of work, uh, our group had been able to reach a lot of officials within this majestic entity. And one of them was a former CIA director named Bill Colby. And Bill Colby was getting up there in years. He was old. And he was a member of this group. He had concluded it was time to help us. So he agreed through a colonel who was his best friend, communicated to my team and said, look, we want to meet with you and we want to hand off one of these devices, fully operational, and about 50 million US dollars in seed funding so you can get it stabilized and secure and out initially to the public. I said, good. The week that he was going to meet with us, they found Mr. Colby floating down the Potomac River and he had been murdered. Um, yes, absolutely. His wife admitted as much to CNN. Now, nobody knew why this sudden taking out of a former CIA director, and it was never investigated as a murder. It was an accidental drowning. But it was a shot across the bow to others who would like to bring and defect from this group. And it scared a lot of them, including then President Clinton. I mean, he wasn't very brave, but he wasn't stupid either. I would prefer to be with someone who is intelligent and has courage, however. So after this happened, and we began to analyze what the dynamic of this was, it became very clear that we were going to have to do some more groundwork for this bringing out of not only the information, but the actual technologies that can give us a new civilization, a new earth, a new planetary society here. And in the course of this analysis, we said, first we have to do, we've made the contact, and this is now ongoing, as you've heard yesterday. It is amazing, and it's going up exponentially in the last six months. We have to do disclosure. That's been done. People say, when is disclosure going to happen? I said 80% of the public already know this is real. It's just a matter of now of the official government's putting their stamp on it. And believe me, the official governments always lag behind us, the people. They're the lagging indicator, not the leading indicator. We in this room are the leaders of this. All of you. And so then I said, well, we have to also lay the foundation for bringing out these new technologies. Now, many people believe mistakenly and I, I was having someone help translate uh, my inter the introductory remarks. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, but I want to be clear on something. A lot of people think that these technologies have all come from the studying of uh, uh, UFOs that have been shot down or something. This is not true. There has been reverse engineering and study of these sort of technologies. And I know uh, men and women who have worked in those programs. But remember, the laws of the universe have a very nice coincidence. They're universal. And so if they can be developed in Alpha Centauri, or the Pleiades, or anywhere, any galaxy, they can be developed here. And guess what? Through the minds of people, beginning in the late 1800s, this knowledge started coming through. Nikola Tesla, for example. T. Townsend Brown, who started doing in the 1920s, anti-gravity, high voltage electromagnetogravitic effects where things would levitate and lift. He then developed this uh, with a professor at Princeton who worked with Einstein, Dr. Beefield, and it was called the Beefield Brown effect. So these things were done independent of any extraterrestrial uh, study of craft. However, when we did finally, tragically, shoot a few of these down, starting back with Roswell and perhaps earlier. 
using electromagnetic weapon systems, we did study it and that augmented, that propelled and further provided an augmentation to some science that was already being studied. See, so, so it's more complex than most people have been presented. I'm trying to give you this background so you understand. Now, eventually, by 1954, and I can give you the month, October 1954, it was decided that all of these technologies, which had begun to be reported openly in the aerospace journals, you can go back to the late 40s and early 50s and read about them, absolutely. They're there, if you can find them. But by October 1954, this secret government, this cabal, that had hijacked this whole issue out from underneath the president, out from underneath other world governments, and became an entity unto itself, decided we're slamming the lid on this and this is not going to be printed, talked about, discussed anywhere, top secret, black, deep black. That was October 1954. So I was not yet a twinkle in my father's eye when all of this went black. But I tell people that the tragedy here is that since before I was born, and now I'm a grandfather, we have not needed oil, gas, coal, or jet engines, rockets, or surface roads between cities. Think how many billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on roadways and how much destruction to the environment. We haven't needed those since Eisenhower launched the Eisenhower interstate system in America that's now crisscrossed with these superhighways spanning the whole continent. Now imagine what a civilization from another star system might think, seeing such galactic <laughs> stupidity. Oy. Ultimately, that is the problem we're trying to correct. It is 50, 60 years of unbelievable corruption and misguided policy that has become entrenched. But doing so now is much more difficult than it would have been in 1902. And if you go to the orionproject.org, it's all one word, the Orion Project, O-R-I-O-N, Orion, like the constellation, project.org, you will see a photograph of Nikola Tesla with a guy, a self-taught engineer named Stubblefield, standing with the Capitol Dome of the United States Capitol behind them after they had shown members of Congress this generator that was like an earth battery, some stakes in the ground, and they would get it running, and it would run itself from this energy field, and the man was running his farm on it. 1902. So let me go back. We haven't needed oil and gas, nuclear power didn't exist then, since 1902. Now, you talk about a crime against humanity and the earth, this is the big one, a huge one. And it's all about corruption of power. And it's time for the people, all of us, to stand up and say, okay, enough of this stupidity. We're better and wiser than this. Let's unite together and bring out these new sciences. Now, if it were easy, it would have been done in 1902. Nikola Tesla had his uh, technologies suppressed. Uh, Westinghouse, J.P. Morgan, the Rockefeller family, they did not want this to be known because it would upset that their apple cart in 1902, just like the apple cart would be upset in 2009. But you know what? In 1902, the world had less than two billion people. Only a fraction of them had electricity and were using oil and gas. Now we have seven billion people and we have one billion motor vehicles on the road. So we have become more addicted and more addicted and more addicted and more addicted from into this paradigm of a planet killing system. And that is what we must go past and beyond and leave that behind. Whatever people will say, oh, it would be too disruptive to the economy. What will happen to the petrodollar? How about unemployment in the energy sector? Well, there'll be new jobs. It's like saying we shouldn't bring out uh, a car because people making 
horse carriages for horses would be out of business. This is ridiculous. That excuse has been used as a false paradigm so that people will stay in line with the power elite that have the power they have. And so we have to say to our leaders and to each other, let's find a way to come together, those who are engineers and scientists, those of us who are uh, leaders in the new energy movement, the public who are concerned about the environment and energy, and those who have the resources financially to do this. Not any one person, certainly not me, can do all this. Let me tell you a little secret about myself. I can't hook up a DVD player. My wife has to do that. I'm such a stupid, unless it's a defibrillator for the heart or a respirator for the lungs, forget about it, I'm an idiot with machines. So don't ask me to build one of these things. I can't hook up my DVD player. My wife does that for me. Yeah, I'm really terrible with such things. So we need to combine forces. We need to combine this effort. And when we do, then we're gonna need to have the strategic leadership to make the run. It's a huge run for the goal. We have this goal, and that's to get it out to the people quickly. Because any time one of these technologies surfaces, and there have been many, such as the Stan Meyer car that was running on water, and then he died suddenly, and his work had a national security order slapped on it before he died. And now it's sitting in a warehouse somewhere with a family who really doesn't know what to do with it, and it's a very complicated situation. We've been trying to get them to help let us bring this back out, but it's very difficult, and you know, that may not happen. But the same technology can be done by this gentleman, perhaps, or this gentleman, or this woman. Why not? I don't have that skill set, but someone here might. And here's what will happen if they do, and they can have a discussion with me. And we can do this privately. I'll sign a confidentiality agreement if it's a commercial issue. Is that we will put our entire strategic team behind it, and within weeks to months, it will be seen by billions of people. We will do a, the largest press conference in history, and we have the people who will get there. And, and, who, and absolutely, if we can test and vet this system so that the scientific certainty is there, it will be disclosed rapidly, long before it's available for sale. Why? Because if you sit on something like this, one of three things are going to happen. Someone's going to come along and offer the group that has it more money than God has to buy them out. This I know because I know people who sold out. Number two, they will be ordered, if they don't sell out, to keep it quiet under threats of all kinds. In the United States, there are over 4,000 patents because we had someone in the patent office who was there, a witness to this. 4,000 patents on these kinds of technologies that have been falling under the National Secrecy Act. And there's a Title 35, Section 180 and 185 of the uh, title law, patent law in the United States that allows for a national security seizure. And this has been abused by the power elite to keep these things secret once someone tries to get a patent. So that's a whole problem. And then there are the people who have just been flat out killed. Now, I've had plenty of threats directed at me. It doesn't matter. No one's going to stand me down. And as I said yesterday, If I have to be taken out feet first in a coffin, then I give myself to God, so be it. This is it. And unless you're willing to make that level of commitment, get off the stage, because I can tell you what's coming at you. What I call, politely, Murder Incorporated. And mur <laughs> Murder Incorporated or these consortium of interests that will do anything to keep this information from coming out. Now, 
This means that there has to be a very well thought through strategic plan to get something from a prototype that would sit on that podium that proves this principle of extracting energy from the zero point or quantum vacuum flux field. I don't want to get too technical. I'm only a country doctor from Virginia, so I'm, I don't pretend to be a physicist. I know enough about it to get myself in trouble. But I can describe how it works. And basically, these systems, when you look at them and, and how they're operating, you can bring them forward very quickly as a prototype. Now, it may take a little longer to have a manufacturing and distribution and all of that. But you can certainly bring it out very, very, very quickly in terms of announcing it to the world. And why? Because this is the message of great hope. Imagine what our people all over the world would say when they realize we're not having to destroy the planet to live. We don't have to go back to the Stone Age. We don't have to uh, commit what I call planeticide, the deliberate killing of a planet in order to have lights and air conditioning and run around in cars. This, this would be such a hopeful event for all of mankind, all of the human race. And our younger generation, people who are my children's age in their teens and 20s, this would give them a light where when they look into the future right now, they just see catastrophe. So this would be a wonderful event for humanity. But to do that, you've got to have enough people who are the friendlies, I call them, within the power elite who want to see this happen, who have your back. Now, we have those. I wouldn't be alive today if I didn't have a whole group of those. It's not easy to talk about this, but this is how it works. And certainly not all of them support what I'm wanting to do. But enough of them do that when we move forward with this information, they're going to say, great, let's do it with you. And we have now over 160 of these people who are very powerful around the world who would say, if you have something like that, we're not going to do it, but we'll quickly fall in line behind you. So that has taken 19 years for me to build that system. And there's a whole 39-page strategic plan that we have where every line on every sheet of paper is a major strategic action point. And this is all ready to roll if we can get our hands on something that works. Now, we have seen more frauds and more crap going around the world looking for this stuff than you can shake a stick at. There's a lot of nonsense out there. But we've seen some of the real things, too. The problem is the people who have had those have said, it's too dangerous, I've already had threats, and they don't want to do it. One man whose laboratory we were in had amazing stuff, had a dozen of these sort of devices there, and he said to me, well, I don't mind being a little bit of trouble for this cabal, but I don't want to be a major pain in their ass, because they're going to come after me and they've already threatened me. So what we need to do is find both people who understand the science and are inventors who will go the distance without fear and have the courage to do it. And this has been very, very difficult. Let me explain something that happened in the last seven months or so, eight months. And when you hear this, you'll be astonished, and you may weep. I wept. We had a man, I have to be very careful about how much information I give about this situation, who was assigned to a a very compartmented, classified project. Uh, he was a civilian, a brilliant inventor, someone who knew much more than Tesla or Einstein or any of these people. He had worked out down to the mathematical formula, all the trans-dimensional technologies up to and including, and I'm going to give you a short list, teleportation, dematerialization, anti-gravity, electromagnetogravitic, energy from the vacuum, et cetera, and so on. And I'm just getting started. This guy is amazing. I've been in his lab. His, now the way this works, let me explain this a little bit. Someone like that, he was in, had his own company. The intelligence community came in and stamped everything top secret, put it in a vault. He then got pulled in as a contractor 
to do special projects for these compartmented operations. Over the last five years, we had convinced them to set him free and to work with us on these technologies. And there were five what they call shepherds. This is the word that's used in the intelligence community, who were his shepherds, who were in charge of this kind of classification or policy. And they all agreed it was time to bring out the first level of what this gentleman could do, which was basically an energy generation device that would run your home or you could put in your car and you would never have to touch a drop of oil and ever have an energy bill. Because he had this, I mean, we saw these things. Now, at this point, what happened is we said, all right, has this actually been vetted, uh, evaluated independently? And they said, yes, absolutely. The top Department of Defense laboratory near Washington, DC, had taken his information and independently, without his assistance, just from his uh, formula and designs and engineering specifications, replicated precisely what he had, and it worked. When they did that, a group of people came in and said, leave this alone and put it in a vault and never let it come out again. I know the chief scientist of this lab, who is a very good friend of mine. So this is a technology that has been built, tested, independently reproduced, on the shelf, ready to go. In November of 2008, this past November, Dr. Bravo and I and Dr. Loader, our science advisor and our board, hosted this gentleman at my home in Virginia. I live in a country house out near Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home. And he came and we met for several days and he agreed to build that within three months, one of these systems so that we would be able to have this out by this spring to you, the people who need it, the good people of the earth. His intelligent shepherds had said, yes, do it. All of them, all of them together. I had met with them. Within three days of his returning to his skiff, which is the term used for underground electronic eaves prop, Eve's proof place where you cannot get any communications in or out, but it's a highly classified facility. He was reordered out of that facility and dropped into a rat hole in Iraq as a support technician. This, one of the most brilliant scientists on the world today. He called me up and he said just over and over again, Dr. Greer, just be careful. Dr. Greer, just be careful. Dr. Greer, just be careful. He was, someone had put the fear of God in him, and he thought he had a clear go because these really well-placed intelligence operatives, but some other people from outside those five shepherds came in and said, oh, no, you don't. Now, let me tell you what I've asked President Obama to do about this situation. President Obama has received a briefing, a special presidential briefing from me. And if we had time, I would read all of it to you. It'll rock your world. But part of it has a section talking about these energy technologies related to this whole, oh, what I talked about yesterday, WSFM, which is what the CIA calls it, weird science and frickin' magic. And in this original that has been provided to the Barack Obama administration and to the new CIA director, I say, look, this man has told me he wants to do it. His immediate shepherds in the intelligence community want him to do it and bring this at first level of this science out. Not the anti-gravity stuff, because that does have some defense issues, but the generation of energy. And we need an executive order from the President of the United States to specifically order this man back to this country or to the United States or someplace outside a war zone to work with us in a white world Manhattan project to bring free and new energy to this planet. Yes. We need it.
And here is what I would like each of you to do. Rather than us all being passive and saying, oh my God, what can I do? There are all these characters out there. We need your help. Go to the orionproject.org and let President Obama know that you have learned of this and that there is a man that Dr. Greer knows very well and have his home address, his phone number, his curriculum vitae and resume and know everything about him. And that this would be the new energy economy Barack Obama promised us. And we have an automatic fax system set up, ready to go, from the orionproject.org, where you can fill out a letter and zap, send it right into the White House. All of you, the hundreds of you here, should do it tonight. And then tell all of your friends and all of your family and all your coworkers to do it. And flood the White House email and fax system with this request. Please do it for us. So we live in a very exciting time. This whole adventure has been quite a roller coaster for me and my wife and family, and for everyone with whom I work. Enormous work has gone into getting to us where we are today, where we have achieved disclosure, we have made contact, and now we want to bring these energy technologies to the world. And that can be done with your help. I know we have the capacity to do it. And there's a, one, of, one of the most renowned uh, physicists in the world who works in this area has said that the only group that really has a chance at making a run at this is the group that Dr. Greer's put together, both strategically and in terms of leadership. I know we can do it, but we can't do it alone. Because guess who our first level of protection is? Yes, I have security. And yes, we have people in the secret government watching our back. And yes, we have extraterrestrial guardianships watching us and beyond, angelic. But you know the most important is you, each one of you. The reason we went public with as much information as we could, and I'm giving you, I'm really pushing the limit with what I'm saying today, and what I've said at this conference, is that you being informed, and you telling others, and millions of people around the world who follow what we're doing and know what we're doing, well, you know what that does? That puts a one billion watt spotlight on our project. And what happens when that occurs? These murderers don't like to do things when there's a big spotlight. They're like cockroaches that only come out when the lights are off. La cucaracha. <laughs> <laughs> and so the light of truth and the light of disclosure and the light of everyone knowing about this and being aware of it has been our first line of protection. And for that I thank you and I thank Pepon and I thank the uh, organizers of this conference. You see, this is a, a symbiotic. Now much of what I have to do, obviously, has been behind the scenes, and I've been criticized for that. People say, how can you meet with these devils? I said, because they can be transformed also. The power of consciousness, the power of prayer, the power of goodness. Can you imagine that today, 70% of this cabal would like to see this done? Now, the 30% that are the most violent and ruthless have intimidated them, just like when they killed CIA Director Colby, who was trying to help us. But <laughs> here's the point. I'm expendable. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, after I briefed the CIA Director for President Clinton, his, you know, his best friend came to the house and said, to my house and said, I mentioned this yesterday. He said, well, the president won't do this. He'll end up like John F. Kennedy. And I said, let's say Dimash. It's too bad. He's the president. I'm not. I'm just a doctor here. At the time, I was living in North Carolina running a busy emergency department. And he says, oh, no, Bill Clinton won't do it. He, they, he said, but you can. I said, what do you mean I can? What am I, chopped liver? The expression meaning I'm nothing. And he basically said, yes. You see, because I'm a nobody, 
And because I'm not important, and because I'm expendable, and because we are the common people, we can do it. They can't. Here's the irony. We're free. They're not. And God help us, we need to step into that power and make this change happen. <laughs> Now, I will tell you that there are some areas that are valid national security concerns with these kinds of technologies. Uh, the electromagnetogravitic systems that would allow you to go from here to, well, let's say, Afghanistan and back in three or four minutes, this could have a defense application, obviously. However, there are other configurations of the technologies that would allow us to just bring out the energy generation component initially. And I see this as a multi-phased process, although we're running out of time to phase it in. It should have started to be phased in in 1902. If the world had evolved to where it could have been, by 1955, we would have not had surface roads. It would have been like the Jetsons where we're floating along. Absolutely. They were fully operational by then. I have photographs from the late 50s and early 60s of what are called alien reproduction vehicles, although it's a bit of a misnomer because they weren't all from studying the ET craft. Some of this was coming along before we began to study the ET craft. And these vehicles were fully operational by then. The irony is that, as Bob Dean pointed out, there are two space programs. The space program we know about and the space program that's secret, absolutely. Now, my uncle worked in the space program we know about because he worked on the lunar module. But you hear things, you learn things when you're at that level of aerospace engineering at Northrop Grumman. But I think that the critical point here is, is that a lot of people say, let's let everything out all at once. And I tell you, I can only do so much. I'm not as young as I used to be. And the other point is, I think we need to walk straight perhaps before we levitate. I would be happy just to be able to run this building without fossil fuels, wouldn't you? Let's do that as a starting point. That we can do this year and next if we get moving. Absolutely, it can be done. And so what I am asking you to do is help us identify, number one, the people in society and in your own circle who are supportive of new energy research. Number two, if anyone here knows of an inventor or an engineer who actually can do this or has done it, that has something ready to be evaluated and will cooperate with a very fast-moving strategic plan to move it out, they need to get hold of me immediately. And number three, if anyone here knows of some people who can provide the startup funding that's clean, not corrupt money, <laughs> clean money, I've turned away tens of millions of dollars because I knew it was dirty. I'm being modest. I turned away $2 billion. Can I tell you this story? <laughs> I can tell you money means nothing to me. Back when I first got involved with this, the head of Army Intelligence approached me, and he wanted me to fold my operation into his. And he offered me a $2 billion fund for my personal use if I would do so. And I said, no thank you, I'd rather be independent. And he was not happy. <laughs> he then went to my wife. Now, you have to understand, my wife is this, this sort of earth mother, Ivy League educated, but very down to earth, uh, epitomizes noblesse oblige. Uh, when she was in the Peace Corps, they called her Saint M. She's this beautiful, kind, spiritual, beautiful person, without whom I could not have done this. She's really the wind beneath my wings. Yeah. Oh, and in, and in four weeks, we celebrate our 30th anniversary. So, uh, so. <laughs> so, 
And believe me, she deserves a medal for that. 30 years with me, oi. Okay, so. <laughs> So he, the, the head of Army Intelligence went to my wife and said, oh, you know, we would like, we have a special shield, like a crest for your husband. So he can be joined in the top nine people involved with these uh, projects. And you, you, can you convince your husband to do that? He didn't mention money to her at all. He mentioned this thing, it was flattery and ego stuff. And she came to me and she was very sweet. She says, oh, he was so nice and he had such wonderful things to say about you and they so much want. I said, Emily, you know, he's a devil with forked tongue. I said, no way, Jose, ain't gonna happen. And she said, oh, okay. Later I had other offers. And so that was in 1992. So for 17 years, I have been offered up to multiple billions of dollars. I have had my life threatened and my best friend murdered. And I have been reviled and ridiculed and everything done to me. Up until I just before coming here, horrible death threats and people staking out my house. And you know what? I am only redoubling my effort. Screw these people. You know, Because this I will promise you, as soon as we find one of these systems, energy systems, that is legitimate, can be independently verified and reproduced, that's the sine qua non of science, reproducibility, and is ready for prime time, we will come out with it. And no amount of money, no amount of threats, nothing will deter us from doing that. And if they give me a national security order to stand down, I will go on CNN and the BBC and your Spanish network and I will tear it up in front of one billion people live and say, screw them. Because here's a little simple legal fact. And those of you who, and I'm not getting riled up here, sorry. Uh, this is how I am, very passionate. I'm nice until I'm not nice, and then it's kind of hell on wheels. But <laughs> these people, <laughs> these people are the rogues. Not us. We're not the rogues. We're the good people of the earth wanting to create a better world for our children and our children's children's children going into the future half a million years. Can you hear the children calling you? They're waiting. They're waiting in a cosmic waiting room coming to this planet. You can see it. You can feel it. This is our sacred obligation. And so I have to say this because many people have said, how can you put these sort of documents out on the street and in books. How could you bring out 110 people with top secret SCI, Special Compartment and Intelligence Security Clearances, and bring their testimony out to a billion people, which we have done? Ah, here's what we did. In 1998, 11 years ago, after we determined that the President of the United States multiple of them, had been denied access to these projects, that at least one of them had been murdered over this issue. I have a document to this effect. And I know two of the people who set up the logistics who killed Jack Kennedy. I know them personally, they're old guys now. That they have lied to the Senate Intelligence Committee, they have deceived your government, the European Union, and even high officials in the United Kingdom and in the British royal family that I have connections to. In addition, you have people like Lord Hill Norton who came out publicly with the Disclosure Project material as you have seen. And he said to me, I was sitting at his house in Hampshire in England and he was sitting here and I'm sitting here and he was a very short man. Well, most people are short compared to me, but, but he was about five foot two and had steely blue eyes and he was a five-star admiral and very feisty. 
And what happened is that as we were sitting there, and he was really wanting me to tell him everything I had been sharing with President Clinton and all these people, I, he, he eventually said to me, and it was very typical of what I've heard from many of these officials, he said, you know, I was head of the Ministry of Defense for Great Britain. I am a five-star admiral, what they used to call a sea lord in England. And I used to be head of the military committee for NATO. And they never told me about any of these things. And he asked me, why? And por qué? And why do I be left out of this? And I said, my friend, you're in the same boat as the CIA director I met with and the president. I said, unless you've been brought up through the system, they don't tell you. So it doesn't matter what your rank is or position. It's whether you came up through the system and they tested you for whether you will go with the agenda of secrecy and destruction and warfare. And then they will put you any information you want. Little by little by little, they'll give you little bits until you violate their trust, and then they'll either kill you or kick you out of the program. But you were assessed. The first thing they do with someone like you is a soul biopsy. What is this, a soul biopsy? In the medical term, biopsy, take a piece. They take a look at your soul, and they want to see if you're a, a stand-up guy, a good person, and you're not going to go along with a criminal enterprise, they're not going to tell you. Because if they did, they'd have to do to you what they did to Lord Mountbatten, and what they did to John F. Kennedy, and what they did to Bill Colby. They would have killed you. So they protected you by keeping you out of the loop because you would not go along with that agenda, would you? He says, you're bloody right, I wouldn't not for one damn minute. I said, well, that's why they didn't tell you. Now, after I'd gone all over the world and met with people like this, we made an assessment that these programs were illegal, unconstitutional in every country, a priori, they could not use the law to protect themselves. And the same applies with these technologies. If they issue any inventor a national security order, he needs to get hold of me so I can take him by the hand and rip that thing up and say, these people have no legal standing because they're the criminals. <laughs> now, this is basic constitutional law and basic law. You can't break the law and have a criminal enterprise and then say, oh, I'm going to use the, the law to protect myself and to hide things. They cannot have it both ways. And therefore, we're on the side of the angels. We're on the side of the law. And so we should go forward with that certainty, not thinking that it's easy, not thinking that it is without risk. Is anything wonderful and great done on this planet without some risk and some effort? This is Earth not Haranya Loka or some astral heaven. This is the, you know, it takes work to do this. But I will tell you this, this is the pearl of great price. This is what you don't throw back into the sea. This knowledge that you have received this weekend at this conference is knowledge about really a sacred responsibility, a call to action a call to do something about this. Not only peaceful contact with interstellar visitors and disclosure, but seeing that we lay the foundation for these technologies to come out to be used for peaceful energy generation to save our planet from the abyss it is going into and to alleviate the suffering of the planet. Because for most of the people on the planet today, a third of the planet's population lives on less than $2 a day. It's already a cataclysm. It's already terrible. And if we have any compassion for those people, we will say we will make an effort for them, for all the children of the earth. Because it is only when there is justice and only when there is a certain decent standard of living that we can become a civilized society living in peace. We cannot have peace where 80% of the population is in poverty, where there are two or 300 families and corporations that have half of the world's net worth and wealth. This is not a, a sustainable situation. So there are a thousand reasons to do this that are all good reasons. And the only reason not to 
our fears, our timidity, our weakness. And this is the time where I'm telling you, we have to transcend that. We have to look across to that far horizon, that we're going to make it together. We're on this planet together, schoolhouse Earth, and we are going to make it through. The only question is how much difficulty, how much tumult, how much catastrophe. And this is totally dependent on what we do with our free will. This is the sphere of free will. The ETs are not going to land and make this happen for us. Then we would learn nothing. It's like trying to impose Jeffersonian democracy in Iraq. Silly. They're wanting us to do this so that we become a peaceful civilization and then the cosmos will open wide its arms and embrace us. So we have these tasks before us. Contact, disclosure, new energy. And the promise of all of these things is that as we pass through this journey over the coming months and few years, we will have laid the foundation for a civilization that will be here, unbroken, in peace, for 500,000 years. That's the era that has just opened. And that's the vision we should share from heart to heart with our loved ones and our co-workers and the president of Spain and your parliament. I don't, is it parliament? I'm sorry, I may be using the wrong word. But we have to educate our leaders, but not wait for them. Many people say, are you waiting? I say, no, I'm not waiting on anybody. Forget that. If I made any mistake during the run-up to the Disclosure Project, is that I gave the Clinton administration and the US Congress too much time. I gave them six years. I'm giving Barack Obama less than a year. And I have announced to him, now I'm gonna say something here I have not said publicly, get me in more trouble, who cares? <laughs> if within a... <laughs> If within a year of his taking office, they have not taken, taken definitive action on these issues, we are going to form together the Council on Interplanetary Relations, and we're going to formalize contact and bypass these useless governments in the world. getting started. We're going to make open contact and we have at least one G8 country that has written me a document. How I wish I could read it to you. It is the most important document in the history of the UFO subject and the irony is I am not at liberty to disclose it and I'm head of the damn disclosure project. <laughs> this is a gentleman's agreement because it's a delicate negotiation. But in this document, imagine this coming from the most senior ranks of a major government in the world. They have said, we wish to go on a long-term journey together to make contact with these extraterrestrial civilizations. Will you work with us? And I said, yes. So we have at least one major government who wants to do it. And you know what? If Obama doesn't get on board, he's going to be left behind in the dust of history. Just that simple.
And number three, we are going to persist in identifying these new energy technologies. And I have been told here in Spain, there may be one or two of these waiting to come forward. I hope what I've heard this week is true. I've had some wonderful meetings. And if it is, we will be the carrier vehicle to launch it to the world. And there is no force on the planet that will stop us. But we will need your help. And will you help us? Will you join with us when we call? Tell everyone we have this. Don't let it fall apart. Don't let it get lost. Because we stand on the morn, the edge of eternity, a time where this planet will become one of the great jewels in the diadem of the cosmos, a place of peace, a place of abundance, a place of enlightenment. And we, all of us, and our children that are coming behind us from the other side, we will become ambassadors in the future to other worlds that have come this way and are coming the way we have come. And so the cycle of life continues in the universe, and we are all part of that. Thank you for joining me. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you.